back to the Meeple Marathon and our continued coverage of It's a Wonderful Kingdom. Uh, this is the uh, follow-up game to It's a Wonderful World with uh, a few key differences, uh, but at the core of it, it is still the same uh, resource collection engine building game that you are familiar with, um, very similar to Seven Wonders, or if you're familiar with It's a Wonderful World, you could easily dive right into this game. But I'm gonna cover um, how to play in this uh, video. Some of this stuff, if you're familiar with It's a Wonderful World, might be repetitive. Um, but I'm going to go through that stuff pretty quick because I think that stuff is pretty easy to pick up on. And I'm definitely going to cover the uh, things that are different for It's a Wonderful Kingdom from It's a Wonderful World. So let's go ahead and get that out of the way and slide this into the middle and quickly talk about our resource board here. So the, one of the biggest differences of It's a Wonderful Kingdom is this is a technically a two-player game. Now there is a solo mode so you can play it solo but this cannot be played with three or four players. Um, it is really just meant to be a head-to-head -head game. So you have this board here where you each have an end and then you have uh, it creates lanes on the left and right side. If you're playing solo there's nothing that says you can't turn this here. Uh, creates a little bit better space and then you can just make sure you have room uh, on the right side and the left side to create your drafts. Uh, but the board is actually meant to be turned this way because the drafting phase uh, in It's a Wonderful Kingdom is very different from the way it was in It's a Wonderful World and or games like uh, Seven Wonders. Those games are simply uh, draft uh, dra a round of drafting to gain the cards into your hand for that round and that means that you're going to be dealt uh, you know a handful of cards you're going to choose one and then you're going to pass to either your player to your left or your right and that player who you passed away from is going to pass their cards you you choose one you pass it on you choose one you pass it on so essentially you're getting to take a peek at everyone's deck but the cards you choose and the cards they choose everybody's decks going to be a little different but that's how you end up with your cards in this game, you are playing what's called a split and trap mechanic. Very similar to the I split, you choose mechanic, but there is a way to trap people um, with some hidden information. So a, um, a famous game that is I split, you choose is a slice of New York pizza, which essentially just has people taking slices of pizza and, you know, the the supreme pizzas are worth more points than the pepperonis and you're like counting up toppings things like that but you basically you create a little pizza and then you're going to divide up that pizza into however many players there are in the game then whoever splits up the pizza is going to actually be the last one to choose so what you're hoping is that you split it fairly enough or you split off the you know really nice pieces with the anchovies or something like that um and you know, you're, you're not wanting to create something that would be too good to pick up because obviously the first player would just pick that up. So you want to make it a tough decision. So what you're going to do here, uh, first of all, is everybody's going to be dealt seven cards. So this is pretty similar here. I think that's seven. Um, and most of these you can see are uh, very similar to It's a Wonderful World. You've got some... Uh, slots here that you need to place resources here once you do you build this card and you gain this benefit during the production phase at the bottom or some of them have instant uh, things that you're going to earn here so for example if I wanted um, uh, some you know uh, standard and then gold resources throughout my production phase I would want to get three standard resources here to build the market and then during the production phase I'm going to get one of each Something new to It's a Wonderful Kingdom are these treasure cards. These treasure cards are simply giving you two resources. They cannot be constructed. You can see there's no other benefit to them, but essentially they're the same as recycling a card. So any card that you choose not to try to build can be just discarded for the resource up in the upper right corner. So that's all these are good for, but you can see they're giving you double resources. But other than that, you're going to be given a hand of cards that are going to be secret to you, and you're also going to take one of these Calamity cards. So you're going to have eight total cards in your hand, seven good ones, and one Calamity card. Then, 
someone is simply going to take the top two cards from the development deck. That's this deck, the big deck of cards with all the, the good stuff in it. And they're gonna place one card on either side of the board here. Then the first player is going to decide, hmm, what two cards from my hand do I want to add to the display? Now, so let's just say for example, I want to put out these two for whatever reason. I could split them up evenly. I could even put them all to one side. Whichever way I choose, hopefully it would have some strategy to it, but whichever decision I make here of how to place them out, the other player is going to pick right or left and get all of those cards, all right? So let's just say, for example, that I really want this card and I'm willing to take a Calamity in my hand to get the Golrock Tomb. I could go like this and I could say, all right, I dare you to take this side. You're gonna take a Calamity. You know you're taking a Calamity. I'm hoping that you're gonna steal that. You're gonna take this card and not stealing it. I hope you're gonna take this card, which is gonna leave this open for me in the next round. So you've got these Calamity cards, which can kind of sway people. Other than that, you get to decide which cards you play out of your hand two at a time, which two are you gonna put down and where are you gonna put them? On the right, the left, you're gonna swap them. Um, but then when you're the person placing cards, the other person is the one taking one side or the other. And they're just like taking it into their kind of player area. They're not doing anything with it right now. Those are just the cards they're gonna get to play with during the round. Then they are gonna look at their hand, choose two cards, place it out however they like. And you now get to choose. And you guys basically keep going back and forth like this until you've placed down all your cards. Now, the trap mechanic, that's the split mechanic. The trap mechanic comes from these two trap tokens that you get at the beginning of the game. And you can choose to, if you want to, take any card and play it. Say I want to be sneaky, play it face down. You put a trap token on top. All right, that way you just, uh, th this is really just so you know you uh, can't trap more than two cards in a round. If you place a card face down, that card has to stay face down. So even if I were to claim this side, I still don't get to look to see what this was until we are done splitting and trapping. Then when we move on uh, to the build phase, you get to finally look at it. But that's the trap mechanic, is the fact that you twice each round you can choose up to two cards to play face down now you don't always have to play the calamity card face down you may still have the calamity card in your hand and maybe you played gold rocks tomb because this is what you really want face down and you're trying to trick the other person you're bluffing by saying hmm you think this is a calamity so you're going to go over here and then i'll just take it next turn because i know what it is that's the biggest difference between it's a wonderful kingdom and it's a wonderful world, is this whole split and trap mechanic. This is how you draft your cards versus just uh, take one and pass, take one and pass, take one and pass. So, and again, you guys could, you could say for your first round, go here and let's say they take that pile. And then the next person I know I'm, I'm dealing in both could go here and you could say, mm, I really don't like any of these. I really want this one, so I'm only gonna take this one. And then you could do the same thing, but you could say, mm, I'm gonna throw a Calamity over here and I'm gonna throw this one here. Well, then he's like, I don't want that Calamity, I'm gonna take this one, all right? And then the last person could say, mm, all right, I'll sweeten the pot a little bit more. How crazy are you? And you could go here, all right? And I could even maybe take this one, which is gonna leave me with way less than eight cards. See, in It's a Wonderful World, you always ended up with a the same hand size at the beginning of every uh, build phase. In It's a Wonderful Kingdom, your hand size may vary from round to round, and it may be drastically different from the person you're playing against. So just keep that in mind, that the way this whole split and trap mechanic works, it can lead to variable hand sizes. So. 
This next part is for people who, uh, if you are familiar with how to play It's a Wonderful World, feel free to skip to the next part of, um, of this how to play video. But we're just gonna talk about how you go about um, doing the build phase and the production phase now, for those of you who are not familiar with how this type of game works. Once you have your hand of cards, and let's just say this is now our hand of cards that we've drafted during the split and trap phase. You now need to decide which of these cards, I'm going to push this up a little bit so we have room, which of these cards do you want to construct and which of them are you going to recycle, aka discard, to get the resource up in the corner. So say you are like, hmm, I need to get some basic resource production. So I'm going to build uh, inventors and the port here. Let's get these out of the way. All right. So you're just going to place them down in front of you in your player area. You need to have a construction area. And they tell you about this during the setup. So you're saying, hmm, I am going to construct these. Now, this is actually a pretty poor hand because I have a ton of gold resources some blue resources, some more gold resources. I have nothing, I have no blue or gold to put in here. So let's change that up again. I'm gonna build the uh, gigantic mine and I'm gonna build, yeah, I'm gonna build this one, subterranean crystals because for some reason I really want to beef up my gold production. All right, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, I don't want to construct any of these cards. I have to recycle this one because it's only giving me resources. And you can recycle them one at a time. But when you do, let's just take this one for example, you discard it, you're gonna gain two of, or you're gonna gain the resources up in the corner, and then you have to place them on a card. So in this instance, I only have one place to put them. I would put them right there. And now let's say I go ahead and recycle this card. That's gonna give me one more blue, bam. I have now completed this card. I'm still in the construction phase, but it doesn't matter. I've completed this card so I can instantly remove the resources and I take it and I put it on top of my duchy. That's the name of your character here that you are starting with. And it's a wonderful world. It was a civilization in its wonderful kingdom. It's a duchy. So then I could also say one, two, three gold fill in this. So boom, there we go. And now I'm ready to move on to the production phase. Well, let's just say for example, that I didn't want to build this card. So I recycled four cards with gold. I get my four gold resources. Now I have no place to put them. All right. What you do with any resources that you either A, don't want to put on a card or have no spot for, you put them on your duchy card over here. And there's a little symbol in the lower right hand corner of your duchy card, which means that anytime you have five resources here, you can trade those back in for one red. Uh, the red is a wild. And this is the only one that can be stored on your duchy card and then later placed out on a card. Once you place a resource on a card or on your duchy card, it's, it's locked in there. It's locked on here. It's locked on your duchy card, and the only way to move it off is to either construct the card, and then you put them back in the supply, or you trade in five, say there was five there, for a red one. The red ones are the only ones that can be moved from your duchy card to somewhere else. But once you place it on a resource, or on a construction card, it's locked in there. It cannot be moved. Um, Technically, once you place a card down for construction, it's kind of locked there until you build it. But if you are desperate for a, say, standard resource, you can recycle a card that is under construction. Now you lose any resources. Say I had uh, put two purple on there and for some reason I couldn't come up with the one, but I was also right here like this and I'm like, mm, I need to build one of these cards. If I recycle this one, I can complete this one. So that's what I'm gonna do. These are just lost. They just go back to the supply. But you can then recycle this card for its one resource, gain that one, and then you would have completed this one. All right, so now that's uh, essentially the construction phase. Anytime you acquire a calamity, it needs to be added to your duchy immediately. And it just sits there and it's gonna be negative four points at the end of the game. There's no way to get rid of a calamity. There's no way to uh, get out 
of the negative four points. It's just something you're dealing with. Now, so your duchy really is um, just here to help start your production phase. They're gonna give you some basic resources here right off the bat. And the A side is gonna give you uh, a scoring multiplier. This just kind of helps uh, drive your decision making early on in the game. Essentially with this Duchy of Teresi here, you're gonna wanna go after the economic cards here because she's gonna give you two points per economic card that you have in your hand. At this point, I have none. But once you have gone through your hand and you've either played them down for construction or you've recycled them for their resource, we move on to the production phase. And what's always been nice about It's a Wonderful World is that the construction phase that we just went over can be done simultaneously. Everybody can go about and do their construction phase at their own pace, and then we move on to the production phase, which again is done simultaneously. In the construction phase, however, you do have to go in a specific order and kind of wait for people to finish each individual uh, resource round before moving on to the next. But what you're going to do is start with your basic um, you know, stone resource or whatever this is called here and you're going to count up the number of icons you have on your sheet, in this case four. You would claim four resources and hopefully you would have some cards to actually place these resources out, otherwise this would not be a very good strategy. So let's bring back some of our cards here that we were looking at earlier. So again, in this instance I gained four of the basic resource this would work out perfectly that I could go like that. Now, as soon as I have placed enough resources on here, I can build this card. Unfortunately, though, I do not get this resource because I've already counted up my basic resources, claimed my basic resources. I cannot retroactively go back and add that one in, but I will get the gold because the gold resource collection phase has not happened yet. So once you do the, the basic stone, you move on to the purple. You look here, I actually have no purple. Okay, so then we move on to yellow. Here I have one, and then this is gold times the number of blue cards I have, which at this point I only have one, so one, two, three. So a minute ago I was only gonna get two, now I'm getting three, and I have a place to put these. But again, let's say for example, I already had two there, and I claim three, I can put one on this card. The other two are gonna to have to go on my duchy, okay? And then from there, you would go to blue, and once everybody has gotten a chance to go through all the phases, we start this all back over again. You're dealt seven cards, you take one Calamity card, so you're always gonna have a Calamity card in your hand, that's always gonna be your eighth card, and you do the split trap mechanic again. This cards that you built uh, laid down during construction, stay there. Uh, the resources that you placed on there, they stay there. And you basically keep doing this for four rounds. The player with the most points at the end of four rounds is the winner. All right, so let's quickly now uh, talk about how do we go about doing all this solo, you say? Well, there's a little bit of setup that's different. Um, first thing you're gonna wanna do is after you've shuffled up your development deck, you're gonna to wanna to take eight cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight cards from the development deck and four calamities. One, two, three, four. This essentially represents the calamity one per round that you would have to deal with at least during the game. So you've got 12 cards right here. You're gonna shuffle these cards up, keep them face down, and set them off to the side. All right, so we've shuffled those up. They're gonna go right there. Let's just put these back in the stack for now. So a um, split trap phase for solo always begins with putting two cards out on each side and then you as the solo player gets to decide which of these sides am I going to take. Mm, I really like the way this one looks so I'm going to take this one put it in my player area. Now what's going to happen is, is that I'm going to take 
one of the cards from this danger deck here. This So this has eight good cards, but four calamity cards. I don't know which one it's gonna be, and I'm gonna place it face down onto the side that I did not choose, okay? And then the side that it was left empty is gonna get two fresh new cards. All right, now again, I get to decide. Do I wanna take the risk and take the larger side? This is gonna give me more things to construct, more resources, or do I play it safe and take the side that I know has no face down cards? Let's just say, for example, I wanna play it safe and I take this stack. Again, this side over here is gonna get the one face down card. They stay face down, those cards stay out there, and this side's gonna get two new cards. All right, now at this point, this may be too much to pass up. This is twice as many cards. I'm gonna be able to do that much more stuff. So I could choose to take this, and let's say I do do that, but these have to stay face down. These can come at me face up. And now the danger card goes over here, and this side gets two new cards. You continue to do this for four rounds. So essentially, if all you ever did was take the two side, you'd end up with eight cards, and that's kind of the standard hand size uh, for a game of It's a Wonderful Kingdom or It's a Wonderful World. Now, in the solo mode, you actually don't get trap tokens. There's no point. You're not placing the cards down. You're not trying to fool anybody. There's no AI you're playing against. What you do get, though, are these spy tokens here. Now, you start the game with just one, but at the beginning of every round, you get to flip one over. So if you don't use one, you could end up with an uh, instance where you have two to use. But at any point in time, I could turn one of my spy tokens over to the inactive side to flip a card over. And I could say, ooh, I know that's a calamity. I wanna stay away from it. I'm gonna go over here, okay? Pretty straightforward. So those are your kind of spy tokens for the solo mode because you don't get trap tokens. The last thing you can do uh, in the solo mode, which was similar to what you could do in It's a Wonderful World, say you don't like any of these cards, all right? But you really don't wanna go after the Calamity. What you can choose to do is um, discard two face-up cards from either side, but they have to come from the same side and they cannot be a Calamity card. They also cannot be a face-down card. So say I did not want to claim the Calamity, but neither of these cards are worth anything to me. I could say, all right, I'm gonna discard these two cards. And then what you get to do is look at the top three cards of the development deck. And you could say, hmm, I really want this one. And so that's technically the card you're gonna claim. You don't need to put it down, but that's the card you would claim. So that's a little bit of a way to mitigate um, the fact that you're really only kind of seeing one hand's worth of, of cards versus two in a standard game. After that, the phases go exactly the same. You just sit there and you do your own construction phase and then you just go through the production phase on your own. My biggest drawback to It's a Wonderful Kingdom is the fact that it is simply a beat your own score game. Um, but with that being said, there's a lot of uh, new stuff added to It's a Wonderful Kingdom that I'm hoping will um, change the experience enough that'll make it worth purchasing uh, this game, but we'll see. So let's talk about those now. Okay, so what we've just gone over are the basics for how to play It's a Wonderful Kingdom, but It's a Wonderful Kingdom has uh, three different modules that come with the game and you need to choose one of them every game you play no matter whether you're playing solo or uh, head to head you need to choose one of these modules to add into the game so let's now talk about what those modules are and how you incorporate them into the game so let's talk about our quests here this is one of the modules that you can choose to play with you can see that the core game comes with three quests here and there is a solo side you can see here just a little single player uh, icon there and then there's a head-to-head -head side so make sure you're playing on the right side but they're very similar um, so what you see here is uh, technically four different areas where you need to pay a certain number of resources in order to gain a benefit except for this last area this last area is 
what you have to do in order to be successful in the game. So you have to conquer the north in order to say that you are successful in the game. If you're playing head to head, you not only have to conquer the north, but then have more points than your opponent. These other three areas are kind of like bonuses. They are optional, and um, if you actually get around to doing them, they're going to give you a little boon or a bonus. For example, here if you pay seven gold resources, you're going to get four wild resources immediately. That could be very helpful. But again, the only one that you're required to do is this one on the end here. So during the quest modules, all you really have to do is uh, if you have the resources on hand and you choose to, you put them back in the supply and then you're going to take one of your player markers here, just the plain colored disc unless you have the upgraded version. And that's just so you know you can't deploy scouts again. You can only do each one of these once. But if you pay for soldiers, in this case, you would take up to two uh, economy cards from the discard pile and place them into your construction area. Um, so quests are pretty straightforward. Um, you just kind of set this off to the side where everybody can read it. Everybody has the chance to um, do the side quests. And then everybody is gunning for the main quests in order to be successful. So that's the quests module. The next module is the advisors module. And you can see here there is basically just a um, nifty uh, deck full of uh, advisors here. Now advisors are gonna be in the development deck, similar to um, the treasure cards. And in fact, in order to play with the advisors module, um, you are going to replace the treasure cards in the deck with the advisor cards. But first, before you do that, you're gonna deal two advisors to every player. They're gonna choose one and uh, give the other one back. So everybody gets to start with an advisor in their uh, duchy area, essentially, but off to the side. And you're gonna give them their own advisor area. And you're gonna start with two soldiers because all advisors, you'll notice, uh, not only give you a soldier when you recruit them, but all of their powers cost soldiers. So this one says pay two soldiers, retrieve one of your spent trap tokens. All right. This one says pay three soldiers, add the next card from the development deck to the offering area with fewer cards if tied to your choice. So you can see that each one of them even affects the game at a different phase. This one's gonna affect you during the split trap phase. Uh, this one here says reveal one face down card. This can be a card in an offering or in a selection area. This, so this one also is during the split trap phase. Let's find one. Oh, look here. Pay five to discard one of your calamities. So if you're playing with the advisor modules, you have the ability to remove your calamities. Now, once you have an advisor in your area, you can pay the necessary soldiers to activate them, but you can only activate them once per round. Other than the first advisor that you are dealt one of the two and you choose, all the rest of these are gonna be shuffled into the uh, development deck and they're gonna come out into the offering like normal. If you choose them during the construction phase, they're then added to an advisor area next to your duchy and they are immediately available to use. Again, pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but that is the advisor module. And last but not least, is the menace module. So menaces are again providing some negative effects to the game, but unlike calamities, um, which I was just proven wrong that you cannot get rid of, nemesis cards uh, are ones that you can fight. There's a, a battle phase. So um, uh, essentially what you're doing with the nemesis decks is you are replacing the calamity cards with nemesis cards but each one of you uh, when you're playing head to head is going to choose a nemesis to take on so say i kind of want to be the frost giants you claim this frost giant pile and you're never going to claim any calamity cards but this frost giant pile which you can see they're all the same card this is what you draw one from at the beginning of every round so every round I'm gonna have seven development cards and one frost giant card. 
all right, that will then be played into the area, I could get stuck with my own Frost Giant card. I'm hoping that the other player does because what these Nemesis do, Nemesis cards do, and I'm not gonna go through each individual Nemesis and tell you how they work, that is easily explained in the rule book, but essentially you're having to put them in your construction area or in the Frost Giant's case, attaching them to cards and they mess with you. Unlike Calamities, where they're just straight negative points, these cards are going to block you from constructing a card. They're going to block you from uh, gaining resources. It, it, it varies. But to get rid of them, you're going to have to spend soldiers during the battle phase, which is when you play on a Nemesis mode, the battle phase is ended to the after the production phase before you start a new round. At that point, you can take any soldiers you've acquired, spend them just like normal resources to take out, say, the Frost Giant or the Giant Rat or the Shadow, whatever is inflicting your player area. If you are playing solo, instead of taking four Calamity cards and mixing them into your Danger deck, you're just going to pick one set of Nemesis cards, say you want to play against the Frost Giants, and you're going to mix these in place of the Calamity cards. So again, eight development cards, four Frost Giant cards, shuffle together face down, and they're going to come out face down during the solo game. And that, ladies and gentlemen, are the modules. Now you can tell, obviously, that you don't want to play with these all at once, it's impossible, really, because they all require the use of the soldiers. Um, you know, now the soldiers are these tokens that you acquire during the game. Um, but like, you need soldiers to pay to activate an advisor. You need soldiers to fight the frost giant, and you need soldiers to be successful in the ends of the quests. So these are not things. These are not modules that you can mix and match. You have to choose one and stick with it. So soldier tokens, we've talked a lot about them being used, especially in the various modules. They're very important to this game. How do you acquire soldier tokens? Well, there are plenty of cards that are gonna give you soldier tokens uh, when you construct them. For example, the munitions specialist here will instantly give you three soldier tokens once you have constructed the card. But the other way to get soldier tokens is to uh, have supremacy for a particular resource so when you are uh, activating uh, during the production phase and you're claiming resources if you have more resources if you are collecting more resources than your opponent you um, get the supremacy bonus for that resource now in it's a wonderful world those were printed on the board and you basically got a specific thing in it's a wonderful kingdom. It's only uh, soldier tokens. And what you have to do is first train a soldier. So if I am the master of basic uh, resources here, I get to pull a soldier from the supply and place him here to train. And then let's say the next phase, my opponent is the master. He is the supreme in purple resources. He gets to train a soldier. All right, and then it comes to yellow, and I am back to being dominant. I then get to claim that soldier. And if I am dominant and also blue, I would get to train another soldier. His soldier stays there until he gets the supremacy bonus again. And it may just stay there. So keep that in mind that you don't just gain the token, which was similar to what it was in It's a Wonderful World. If you have the supremacy bonus, you first have to slot it into here then you get to claim it and there is only one type of token there's not two like in it's a wonderful world when you're playing solo it's basically the same way except in order since you're not playing against anyone in particular to actually gain the supremacy bonus you have to collect at least five resources so if you're collecting five or more resources you are considered to have the supremacy bonus you can then slot a soldier and then claim the soldier All right, so that's gonna do it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, essentially, no matter which module you are choosing to play with, you're gonna go through four rounds. 
So four rounds of split trap drafting, four rounds of construction, and four rounds of the production phase. You're trying to build up the empire, uh, your kingdom on top, uh, along with your duchy here, to score the most and gain VP. And then uh, you can use this handy dandy dry erase score pad here to count up your basic VP and then any VP you combo off of specific card types. Uh, this is double sided, I don't know why, I guess if one side really gets mucked up. But either way, in a multiplayer game, whoever has the most points wins. In a solo game, you're looking for benchmarks. Now, if you're playing a quest, you could simply say if you, for example, conquered the north, then you were successful in the game and it doesn't matter how many points you score. If you're like me, that's what you do because you suck at the game and you can never even get to the bronze. But for the most part in the rule book, um, you'll see here that they have bronze medal 70 VP, silver medal 90, gold medal 110. There's also these six solo scenarios on the back of the rule book. So if you wanna spice things up again, uh, up uh, when you're playing solo mode, these give you a little bit of special rules, special setup that you might have to follow to make uh, your playthrough a little bit different. Um, but again, these are, are solo scenarios for playing solo. That's gonna do it for um, It's a Wonderful Kingdom. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know in the comment section below. Um, otherwise, if you've enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing to the channel. Once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.